In this episode of Crushed Custard, Fox Drop by Genesis. Why does it fade out? Welcome back to Crushed Custard, and today's album, the one we're taking a look at, is this one. Genesis Foxtrot from 1972. There's the gatefold inner. Open it up, you can see the full picture that goes across the front and the back of the album. So anyway, this was an album that I bought again quite early on in my sort of record collecting career. In fact, I first heard it when I, I took it out of um, the public library in Earlston in Coventry. You can take records out of the library in those days. And I took out um, Genesis Foxtrot, uh, Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon, and a Rush album. I can't remember which one it was. It might have been 2112. Um, simply because at that time I, I was starting to get into all the sort of rock music stuff and I've been listening to most of the Genesis albums that used to get played in the art class at, sc at school um, and it was, I thought it was time to start having to listen to them at home but before I went out to, to buy them you could you could take them out of the, the library and get a listen to them for nothing and of course in those days you could record them onto a cassette tape which I did for ages until I eventually decided it was too good an album for that and I went and bought a copy and you can see if you look back at the front cover early on there you can see the price ticket was still on it it was brand new £1.99 so <laughs> I think it was brand new anyway anyway let's get on to a little look at the album then Foxtrot by Genesis. Now, the album was recorded at Island Studios in London during August 1972 and in an amazing show of alacrity it was released and on the streets by October of the same year. Now Genesis's career at that point was starting to really begin to move in the right direction and they didn't want to be caught hanging around so they got this album out on the streets pretty quick. It was some feat, especially considering some of the complexities of the compositions and I've said it before and I'll say it again, many of today's bands and musicians could learn a lot from the bands of the past and their no-nonsense attitude to getting into the studio and just getting the job done. Anyway, Foxtrot opens up with the classic Watcher of the Skies, which is a prog rock masterpiece, really. It also became a classic live set opener as well. The song boasts the world's most instantly recognisable Mellotron introduction, I think, before it launches into a semi-sci-fi lyric which nods heavily in the direction of the Keats poem on first looking into Chapman's Homer from where the title was actually taken. James Joyce used the term in part of his chamber music too, so that was quite possibly an influence as well. Anyway, with its strong bass, continual time changes and some extremely lively keyboard and guitar sounds, it is unsurprisingly a popular song amongst not only hardcore Genesis fans, but also the more casual fans. I'd certainly put it up there in the top half a dozen Gabriel era Genesis offerings. However, I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb here, alienate myself from most Genesis fans and probably lose all credibility if I've got any at all, by stating that despite the presence of at least three other classic tracks on this album, my favourite track on it is the little mentioned timetable, which follows, I think it's just wonderful. It's a superb, gentle little song full of sort of imaginary sort of lyrics, long lost ideals, Arthurian images, really sort of hits the target with me. It's got a beautiful melody and some great understanding musicianship and it just got me from the very first time that I heard it. Get Out By Friday is the first of the epic playlists within the album and is really Genesis's trademark. Clocking in at eight and a half minutes long, it is most certainly the epic little brother on offer here. Gabriel does his man of many voices 
role playing the roles of several different characters during a track which is basically having a pop at the UK's housing policies at the time. The opening verse sees the fat cat executive instructing his minion known as the Winkler to evict the tenants of a property forthwith and they refuse to leave and the lyric then basically tells the tone of the Winkler's effort to get rid of them by first increasing the rent and then by bribery. Some things never change, do they? We then take into the future where a TV announcement is made that human height is to be restricted to four foot, well, that's the end of me, and so they can fit more people into the properties that the fat cat businessman has acquired. It doesn't actually say how they propose to achieve this, but well, that's what poetic license is all about, isn't it? It's not all about the lyric either. Well, that is obviously the, the song's main focus. Musically, there's a ton of stuff going on with Gabriel himself contributing some oboe, flute, tambourine and bass drum along with his multi-faceted vocal. You can see why he was such a big miss when he left. Side 2 kicks off with Can Utility and the Coastliners, which is a favourite of many a Genesis band. For me, it doesn't quite match up with the other classic tracks on offer on Foxtrot. And it's probably one of the we could cut on, on, on the album. I can't really see its standout appeal to everybody amongst those other good songs, but then I'm not the world's greatest Genesis fan, so I stand to be corrected by those who know better. That, what follows that is a short instrumental track, Horizons, which is played by Steve Hackett on his own. And again, despite being very proficiently played, it's to me, it's a little bit pointless, and it could easily have been left off. An album which, in many ways, is a little bit too long anyway. They have to cram a lot of minutes onto the vinyl, which does affect the sound quality for many people. You do have to crack the volume up on the Genesis albums to get the volume that you need due to the length of the records. This album clocks in at 50 minutes, which was a very long time for an album. At a time in 1972, where a lot of albums were clocking in at 30 to 36 minutes or so maybe some of them getting by that stage to be pushing 40 but most of them were in were in their 30s this one was almost a double album i'm guessing it was only the cost that stopped them from putting it out as a double but 50 minutes again probably a little bit too short for a double but it's extremely long for a single and it does for me affect it a little bit because you can't get the, the same sort of volume out of a 50 minute record as you can out of a 38 minute record and you do have to crack the volume up just a little bit which is not perfect if you're not lucky enough to have a particularly good system. For me cutting out can utility in the coastliners and horizons would have made the album seven and a half minutes shorter and would probably have made it sonically a little bit better at the time because they could have given it a louder cut. Of course in the CD age with remastering all that that's no longer an issue but it was a little bit of an issue back then and anybody buying the album now should be prepared for the fact that the volume on this album is quite low compared to some others. I too is just one song so obviously that can't really be cut although I understand that now this is one of the albums that's going to come out on the Atlantic 75 thing where they're going to split it into a double which means they are going to have to chop the songs in half so I'm not quite sure how they're going to do that with Supper's Ready because it is just one of those classic long tracks. If you were to say, what is the best one-side song ever? I would have to put up Supper's Ready as that track because I just think it is absolutely wonderful. It is great. It'd be interesting to see how they're going to do it on that Atlantic 75, but I've just got a horrible feeling that they might just ruin it. For me, it's more than a long track. It's more than an epic track. It is a musical masterpiece. Basically, the song's composed in seven parts, although there are one or two repetitive themes which reoccur throughout the song. Now, Gabriel goes, Gabriel goes straight into the lyric to Lover's Leap without any introduction and delivers a beautiful vocal and melody over a backing which features a Hona pianet, which is basically a gentle electric piano, several acoustic 12-string guitars, a cello, a flute and bass pedals, which were actually used quite heavily throughout the album by Mike Rutherford. Gabriel claims that the lyric was inspired by a real-life supernatural experience that happened to him and his wife. He claims that one evening she started talking in a totally different voice and had a violent reaction to him holding up a makeshift cross. They did used to dabble in some things in those days, didn't they? Maybe that had a little bit to do with it. The guaranteed eternal sanctuary man is a slightly 
harder, faster piece, which sees good use of Hammond organ and the first drum contributions by Collins. On the opening part, he'd been limited to cymbals, triangles and a bell. Gabriel's vocal is much harder and is more of a rock-type vocal on this part than the gentle folkiness of the opener. A short reprise of which leads into Ignaton and Itzacon and their band of merry men. I just love these titles. They're just classics, aren't they? It's almost a full-blown rock song with a guitar solo and some classic prog interplay of keyboard and guitar. How Dare I Be So Beautiful is another slower session which is based on the Greek myth of Narcissus. At the end of the piece, the lyric suggests turning into a flower, which Gabriel responds quizzically in the voice of a different character. A flower? That leads perfectly into Willow Farm, which again features some truly wonderful lyrics, vocals and characterization from Gabriel. How can you not like lines like mum to mud, mad to dad, dad diddly office, and mum diddly washing, etc. It's just, it's brilliant. Musically, vocally, melody wise, the track is bouncy, jaunty, whimsical, and just total fun. Initially, it was going to be a standalone track rather than part of the Supper's Ready piece. Apocalypse in 9-8 is the heaviest segment featuring a powerful vocal from Gabriel and some pretty hard and complex playing from the band. It then leads into another reprise of the opening section, Lover's Leap, during which Gabriel reverts to the gentler melody and vocal delivery of that opener. But over the chord progression of the second part of the song, the guaranteed eternal sanctuary man. This acts as a segue into the final part of the song, As Sure As Eggs Is Eggs, which provides a powerful ending with Gabriel's William Blake inspired lyrics, which may also nod in the direction of Shelley with the King of Kings reference, belting out over some pretty heavy instrumentation. I have one criticism, and one criticism only, of this epic track. Why on earth was it allowed to fade out after 23 minutes? Surely it deserved an ending. Foxtrot gave Genesis their first UK Top 20 album and really launched them into the big league of progressive rock. With his many character and costume changes, Peter Gabriel ensured that the live shows of the time were almost as much about theatre as they were about music. As good and talented as the rest of the band are, this album positively reeks of the character and personality of Gabriel. And though it's a genuine band effort, I'd have to say that the lyrics and characterizations of Gabriel are what makes the album stand out head and shoulders above most progressive rock albums. The Genesis story would go down a different route in future years, and many are firmly in either the Gabriel or the post-Gabriel camp, with some completely disregarding one in favour of the other. Personally, I'm happy to have a foot in both camps, and whilst Foxtrot doesn't have the polish or the mainstream commercial appeal of a trick of the tail, it's still a five-star classic, and for me at least, is the highlight of the Gabriel years, and maybe even of Gabriel's entire career. For me, it's definitely the go-to prog album. Okay, there you go then, so that was Foxtrot. Still remains one of my two best Genesis albums, or two of my two favourite Genesis albums, Trick of the Tail from the Phil Collins era, and Foxtrot from... The Peter Gabriel era. I know a lot of people go on about Nursery Crime and Set in England by the Pan and Lamb Life Brennan Border. All great albums. But for me, this one has just got that little bit of something. Maybe it's because it's the first one that I've heard and I've got great memories of listening to it. See you next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Crushed Custard. Please like and subscribe as it helps the channel to grow. See you soon. Yeah.